I'm Father Mitch Paquin, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, a program where we take a look at the Bible through the lens of our tradition, and in particular, taking a look at the Gospels in order to better pray through them. Now, we'd love to have you become part of the show. You can do that by adding questions and comments during the live program, which is on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you're in North America, you can call 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside of North America, that won't work, but you can still call in. The number is country code one area code 205-271-2980. You can also send us questions and comments via email by writing to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com. You can also follow us and participate with the show on Facebook and YouTube. Now today we'll discuss the healing of St. Peter's mother-in-law in Capernaum and the way that our Lord Jesus engages the kingdom of darkness by entering into direct combat, healing and exercising a lot of people. Now, if you're interested, I have a book that we're going through. It's, it gives you the text that we're covering. It is called Praying the Gospels. Jesus launches his public ministry. It's available at EWTNRC.com where it is item number 52687. 52687. And we'll be finishing up this book in the next three weeks or so. And at that point, we'll move on to start studying our Lord Jesus' miracles in Galilee. Miracles that amazed the crowds that witnessed them, but also made our Lord Jesus a target of persecution among the Pharisees. For that series of studies, we'll be using the sequel to this book that we're finishing up. That is also called Praying the Gospels, but the subtitle is Jesus' Miracles in Galilee. That is also available at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 52885, 52885, okay? All right, now let's take a look at this. We're going to look at Mark chapter 1, verses 29 to 31. This is where our Lord Jesus heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. It reads there in Mark 1, verse 29, And immediately he, that is Jesus, left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. She came and took her, he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. Now, this is only about 40 yards away from the synagogue. It's a bit closer to the water. The only thing between the house and the water is the old Roman road. And uh, Jesus and his four disciples walked over to the house of Simon and Andrew. You can see a photograph of what it looks like now. That building that you see is a chapel and it's built on four pillars and it suspends that chapel above the whole uh, place, the, the, the original house. Underneath that house or that chapel is the house of Peter. And in addition to being underneath uh, that church, 
you can see, if, uh, here's another photograph, you can see that there is some building material. Uh, one is a circular area and then an octagon-shaped building. Now, the octagon-shaped building is held together with cement. And then below that is the stone house. So what has happened over the centuries is that this Octagon Church was built on top of the original house, and you can see the slight different color. The original house has those stones that are gray colored, and there are more of them than what you can see in this particular photograph. And in that, there was a, a Jewish Christian church. The house was used as a church. And this is here a picture of the synagogue from the church. You can see how close the house of Peter was to the old synagogue. It's just a few yards away, 40 yards or so, that's all. And this, uh, the reason they would do that is uh, Jewish people were limited as to how far they could walk from synagogue back to their homes. And they would typically go there after the Sabbath service in the morning and, and that would take some time. Then they would have a meal that had been prepared the day before because Jewish people forbid the lighting of a fire on the Sabbath. So they would cook the food on Friday and leave it on hot coals and then it would stay warm. And then they would serve that as their Sabbath lunch when they came back from the synagogue. So that's what was going on. And by the way, there are a number of graffiti in that church. Um, and a, a couple of the graffiti include Peter's name. His name is scratched on the rock uh, in different places. And also, from the first century, the fish hooks, two fish hooks were found. They're first century fish hooks. And they were just found lodged in between some of the paving stones. So the Franciscans bought this part of Capernaum from the Turks before the British got in there in 1917 when the British came during World War I. Before that, it was under Turkish uh, uh, dominion, Turkish, Ottoman Turkish Empire, and the Franciscans bought a big chunk of uh, Capernaum, and the Greek Orthodox bought the north half of the town, and they have a church on their half, and the Franciscans have this church. And... Uh, people can celebrate Mass there, of course, and they usually celebrate the Mass of the healing of Peter's mother-in-law or the call of Matthew or Jesus preaching in the synagogue. So there are a number of things that happened nearby. And the, uh, the again, these fish hooks that are found in the floor show that, and they're good-sized fish hooks. The Franciscans found them when they bought this land. They were just in between, you know, as they started excavating, they did a good scientific excavation, and they found this material. So along with the graffiti and the presence of churches built at different periods, second century, uh, I, uh, I know 4th century, and maybe I think there was a 3rd century church as well, that they kept building in the same place because this was the original house of St. Peter. And it's interesting that the chapel, when you look at it from a perspective, it's hard to see from the photograph, but it's shaped like a boat to show that Peter the fisherman lived there. Okay? Now, Notice also that the passage mentions Peter's mother-in-law. You don't get to have 
the privilege of a mother-in-law until you get married. And so Peter was living with his mother-in-law. In fact, he, was, he may have been living in her home. He and his brother Andrew were from a town farther north called Bethsaida. It's where the Jordan River enters into the Sea of Galilee. And this, the town of Capernaum, is a bit farther south along the lakeshore. So um, it may well have been her house moved in with, his, with his wife. And this mother-in-law was sick, right? And uh, Jesus healed her simply by taking her hand. He didn't say anything. He just touched her hand and she was healed. And you can see in this painting that there's a lady who's holding the mother-in-law's by, by the back, probably St. Peter's wife is being portrayed there again. You don't get to have a mother-in-law without a wife. So certainly Peter had been married. And this was something of an ideal for people who get healed because she immediately turns from her own situation and starts taking care of other people. She's healed, so now she takes care of others. This is very important because there have been a number of Christians who have thought of our Lord healing them as an inexpensive form of health care. That's not what the healing is about. It's not uh, as if our blessed Lord is opening up his own HMO or something. That's just not the case. It's a sign of him overcoming his enemies. Who are Christ's enemies? Sin, that's one of his enemies. But there's no indication that Peter's mother-in-law did something wrong to get this fever. But the fever could have taken her life. And that gets at our Lord's second enemy, which is death. Death is not God's ally. Death is not God's friend. It's his enemy. And scripture says that. And for instance, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says the last enemy to be subdued is death. It's important to pay attention to that because there are a lot of people that want to use death as their tool and ally. Think of what the Nazis did to Jews and gypsies and uh, various uh, Slavic people. They first wanted to enslave the Slavic people to force them to work for them, then kill them off. And they also were killing homosexuals, political opponents, all that. The communists, did the same thing. Death was their ally. And so the communist government of Soviet Union killed 61.9 million of its own citizens in gulags, plus the war. And then we see that uh, death is used as an ally for people who want to use mercy killing. They ident they're so allied to death, God's enemy, that they say, well, we'll just do mercy killing or euthanasia, which means a good death. And they'll, they'll try to uh, get rid of people that are inconvenient because they suffer and cost a lot of money. And then, of course, there are those who use death as their ally in abortion. And those who use death as their ally in murder. This is wrong. Killing the unborn, murdering people on the streets, killing for political purposes, threatening to kill, all of these are God's enemy. So that's why he goes after this fever, because his enemy is death. Of course, his third enemy 
is deception and lies because the devil is a liar and, as our Lord says, he's a murderer. And, of course, he leads us into sin. So this, the, the, what we saw as the combat between Christ and Satan in the temptations continues on as our Lord exercised the man in the synagogue and heals people, prevents Peter's mother-in-law from dying an early death, and calls people away from sin. Now, in terms of praying over this text, one of the things you might think about doing is imagine yourself as Peter's mother-in-law. And as, you know, fever is not fun. Many of us have had fevers, most of us probably. There are a lot of bacteria in our world. So we get fevers, and some fevers really get you sick, really weaken you. What would your reaction be to having that fever suddenly disappear as soon as Christ takes your hand? How would you react? You may do well to think back on a time when you had a fever. And what was it like when it finally broke? Some of you have had COVID and survived. And, you know, how did you feel when the fever broke? Probably tired and, you know, worn out. But remember that feeling. And what was it like to have that weakness after the fever broke, where you still felt tired and in need of some more recovery. And in light of that experience of overcoming a strong fe fever, consider this woman who gets healed by our Lord and then gets up immediately and serves. This must have been a healing beyond the natural processes of the body. The body fights against fever. When you have some sort of infection, the body raises its temperature as the body's own way of fighting the, the, the bacteria that caused the, the, the infection and tries to kill it by raising temperature. But it exhausts the body to do that. It's tiring. And here, she has a strength to serve that is not present when people are healed by medicine or by just the, the letting the illness run its course. And it's important to note that the power of our Lord's healing is such that it strengthens her and enables her to give of herself to serve others. Now, Think about your own life. When have you found our Lord as a source of healing? Physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, any one of these. And after you experienced our Lord bringing you some healing and consolation in your life, what did you do? How did you react? And then what I'd ask you to do is Engage our Lord in a conversation. This is what we always want to do in our prayer, is not only consider the, the gospel event, but enter into a conversation with Christ. Ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do with my new strength? What do you want me to do with my healing? Did I do as Christ asked of me? Did I do what he desired? Did I respond to him with generosity or did I take the healing for granted? And then ask him, Lord, what do you expect of me now? Lord, what do you want me to do now? And you might conclude just by saying the Lord's Prayer, especially focusing on thy will be done. That would be a good way to pray over this healing of Peter's mother-in-law. We'll take a break.
and we'll take a look at the aftermath of that healing. So please stay with us. Welcome back. We are now ready to take a look at the fifth meditation in this chapter, which is called Jesus Heals and Exercises After the Sabbath Ended. This is found in Mark chapter 1, verses 32 to 34. It says at that point, that evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. All right, now, first of all, it's important to remember that Jews count the day as beginning with sundown. Sundown is the start of the next day. In fact, in uh, the Maronite Rite and some of the other rites, they have the same system of counting because it wasn't just Jewish people. It was people throughout the region. They, you know, we use midnight because we have a type of, of, you know, accurate clocks that, you know, we can mark with, but they didn't have clocks with the kind of solar accuracy that we have. So they just would use sundown. Now, how would they mark sundown? When you could see three stars or more up in the sky, the sun was down, and the new day had begun. That, by the way, is also why sometimes I get questions. Well, Jesus died and was in the tomb for three days, wasn't he? He said, no. It says that he rose on the third day. The first day was Friday when they put him in the tomb. The next day was the Sabbath rest. He rested on the Sabbath. So he stayed in the tomb all of Easter. And then sundown on Saturday began the new day, Sunday. So he rose on the third day, which was the first day of the week. Just a little thing to note because some people think, hey, I, wait a minute, this is not right. It's not three days. It doesn't say three days. It says on the third day. And we can't blame our Lord for wanting to get out of that tomb as fast as he could. See? So, let's take a look at this. So, um, this, the, the townspeople waited until sundown when they could see the three stars. And that was the time they would carry their sick and demon-possessed to Jesus. Because you can't carry anything on the Sabbath. But once the sun is down on the Sabbath, then you can't. Okay, because again, it's already considered the first day of the week, Sunday. Now, they didn't call it Sunday, by the way. That was a Roman name for it. Um, it was called just the first day of the week. The Jewish people uh, and Arabs uh, count the day. Sunday is the first day, uh, or day one, uh, and then day two and so on. But Saturday is Sabbath. Okay, and even in Arabic, it's uh, Sabbath instead of Shabbat, it's Sabbath. Um, so they use the same system, just using numbers, not naming it after planets. Now, 
we take a look here, the congregation at the synagogue had witnessed the exorcism of the man who was screaming out loud in the synagogue. So they'd seen that. And then, even though it was Sabbath, everybody in town would have heard that our Lord had healed Peter's mother-in-law. This is not a big town. And word gets out fast, you know, in a small town. Everybody starts talking about it. And since they were all aware that, you know, that the neighbors are really very close, the streets are just, you know, like little walkways. So at that point, the people can't wait for the Sabbath to get over, and they come to the door of Peter's mother-in-law's house, and everybody is there outside the door with sick people and demon-possessed. And this actually becomes something of a summary statement about our Lord's ministry against death and Satan. He is fighting against disease that would kill people and against the evil one. And he had already made the announcement in Mark 1, 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. He had said that. But St. John the Baptist had said the same thing. You know, that um, this is what, what he had done. So here we see um, that our Lord is going to go beyond making that announcement and start to fight evil. He over, again, already mentioned, he overcame Satan in the wilderness. You see that in Mark chapter 1, verse 13. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beast, and then the angels waited on him. He gives just a summary of the temptations. But not only does he overcome Satan's temptations himself, and thereby gives us an understanding of that phrase in the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. The Holy Spirit, as we talked about earlier, had led Jesus into the desert to be tempted, and he defeated Satan. He has to take on the combat. But now, in this scene of healing people of sickness and of freeing them from the demons, he is engaged in direct combat with the forces of evil, with the kingdom of darkness. And this is a very important point. Now, this is a great passage to think about. Consider what it would look like. Imagine your front yard full of people who are possessed by demons screaming and yelling and people who are sick with all kinds of sicknesses that might make you sick to see them. Sometimes when people are sick, it's, it's, you know, kind of offensive. And it's important to note that as our Lord sees these people, he doesn't condemn them and say, hey, if you people had a healthier diet, or if you didn't sin, or if you got more exercise, or all this other, he doesn't accuse them. Satan is the accuser. That's what Satan means. Man, we talked about that. Diabolos means prosecuting attorney. The devil accuses us. Christ comes there to heal us and give freedom from the demons. And it's also interesting that he silences the demons because they know who he is. He does not want their testimony. He didn't want the testimony of the demon-possessed man in the synagogue. He doesn't want the testimony of demon-possessed people outside the synagogue. He silences them. And by silencing them and then driving them out of the people, he does a very important thing. He proves that the 
time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Satan's kingdom is starting to fall. Now, another consideration that you might have, I've already mentioned it before, think about the long history of sickness, sin, death, deception that has been part of the world history. And think about how our Lord continues to heal people. You know, the first hospital was started by uh, St. Um, Cyprian of, in North Africa. He was the bishop of Carthage. And even though the pagans had been persecuting the Christians when there was a plague, he and the Christians opened a hospital to care for them. And then the next hospital was opened up by uh, St. Uh, John Chrysostom in Constantinople. And over the centuries, nuns, monks, priests, brothers, all have set up hospitals and mental institutions. The Shrine of St. Dymphna in Belgium is the first mental institution where they would pray for the mentally ill, but also care for them. And they've done this through the centuries. And it was the Catholic Church that opened the first universities and places like the University of Bologna, one, Bologna, one of the, I think it's the second one, first or second one, had a medical school with it. And so did the other schools. We invented the medical school. Before that, you were an apprentice to a doctor. But medical schools were started by the church. Think of the ways that other religious, like Mother Teresa of Calcutta and her sisters and brothers, have worked hard along with lay volunteers to serve the poorest of the poor and sometimes sickest of the sickest. Think about many other orders, the Alexian brothers and many others, who were started to help people during times of plague and disease. They ministered to people, some like the Trinitarians, freed slaves by taking their places on slave ships. They've served refugees, continue to do so over these 2,000 year history of the church. We not only stand up for life, but we also support and run both Catholics and non-Catholics alike clinics to help expectant mothers and help them raise their children and give them medical care after the birth of the child. And it's interesting that the pro-abortion people are attacking those clinics where we take care of women that want to keep their babies. You'd almost get a sense that the pro-abortion people hate women and children. Not just want the right, they say I want a right to choose, but if you choose life, they'll blow up the clinic. Whose side do you think they are? The side of God or the kingdom of darkness? Are they with Christ or are they with Satan? You can imagine what I think. So these are some of the realities. And ask our Lord then, consider these things. Ask our Lord, what are you asking of me, Lord? What do you want me to do? And as I see suffering going on around me, how do you want me to respond? And you know, think about the people who came to be healed. You know, which of the different kinds of suffering do you feel drawn to help in our own modern world? What's the reason or basis for your attraction to help that kind of person? And ask our Lord for wisdom. The wisdom to understand what He wants you to do. And then ask for the grace to strengthen you to do the things he wants you to do so that the Holy Spirit can empower you. And then conclude that kind of prayer where you're talking to our Lord about these things. Conclude with that soul of Christ prayer. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. 
Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Let me never be separated from thee. From the wicked foe, defend me. And at the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to thee, so that with your angels and saints I may praise you for all eternity. Let that be our prayer as a way to end the time. All right. Now, of course, we have some questions. We have one from um, someone, I don't know him, but he's written a number of times, Yaroslav. Um, Father Mitch, um, Yaroslav asks, why doesn't Jesus heal everyone who is asking? Is that on purpose or simply because one's prayers are not so sincere? Thanks. Yaroslav, um, I am very, very cautious against blaming the person who's praying and saying, well, you didn't get healed because you don't have enough faith. Don't, don't ever do that to them. They're already suffering enough. And you don't blame them. Again, that's, that's sometimes the voice of the other side. Our response is to pray for people. And we, for the most cases, we seek the help of medical professionals. Why our Lord heals some people who have no faith at all. Uh, I, I've read lots of stories. There have been very famous people with healing ministries, and they prayed for people with great faith. I remember a woman I knew in Nashville had tremendous faith, tremendous faith. Um, and she, um, you know, uh, was just such a great person, but she died at a very young age of, of her diabetes. You know, but our Lord used her in a lot of ways, and she never wavered in her faith. She didn't understand why she wasn't healed. I didn't either. I prayed for her many times. And she belonged to a charismatic prayer group where they prayed for her many times. But she didn't get healed. That doesn't mean that she was bad or had a lack of faith. She's the last person I would say had a lack of faith. And we enter into a certain mystery as to why. Sometimes our Lord wants us to get involved and do what we can. Other times, he doesn't. Um, I think when we pray for people, they do experience different levels of healing. And doctors like it when other people pray for their patients. Most doctors do. There might be a few atheists or stick in the muds. But most doctors realize that the spiritual component is very helpful. But I also pray that the Lord give wisdom to the doctors and the nurses. That's very important. So those are some of the things that we can think of. All right. Need to take a break. We will come back. We have a caller and some email questions. So please stay with us. Welcome back, and we are starting off with a caller. Thomas, you're over in New Jersey, right? Yes, Father, how are you today? I'm well, thank you, sir. What can we do for you? Yeah, hi, uh, so you stated earlier that um, that our Lord Jesus and, and God is uh, the enemy is death, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, But I was in the understanding that, that God is the author of life and death, so who actually takes life from, from the person? 
I'm a little confused there. Yeah, here's a couple things to remember. When Adam and Eve were created, do you remember what the punishment for sin was? Yes, I believe it was death, but... Death, right. Yeah. Right. But not and it was Satan. Away, right? Yeah, yeah the, the serpent came along and said, oh, you won't die. That's, that's one of the first parts of, temp, uh, of temptation is there, there are no bad consequences from what you do wrong. And so he denies the death. But they, you know, our Lord says to them when he curses uh, Adam, he said, remember that you are ashes or that you are dust and unto dust you shall return. So the, the, the punishment of death, it wasn't immediate death on the spot, but he would suffer death. That wouldn't have been God's preferred way for creation to go. He wants us, to, our souls are eternal and they're meant for eternal life. But now that death has entered in, you know, um, we, we see that it uh, is something that our Lord works with, but this is, um, this is something that we see the uh, change you know, go on where, where, uh, because death has entered, that it's declared to be God's enemy, not only in uh, it's, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. Uh, well, in verse 25, it says, For Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And there are passages, for instance, in the book of Wisdom, which says in chapter Wisdom, in book of Wisdom, chapter 1, God did not create death, but Satan introduced it. So that perspective is consistent in both Old and New Testaments. But our Lord, you know, this is one of the great things. Archbishop Sheen had put this so well, that our Lord had been able to take the sour notes in, introduced by sin and reform them into a new harmony. So if you think of sin as being a sour note in the symphony of creation, but our Lord is able to reuse those sour notes and create new harmonies and new chords that include them. And in one of the things that also becomes a reality is that by our Lord dying on the cross, he's able to defeat death by then rising again. But he had to die first in order to rise. So, yeah, our Lord uses death now, but that wasn't his first plan, and it's his enemy. Does that help? Yes, Father, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Let's now go to John in Rochester, New York. John, what can we yes, do for you this Father, fine day? I said, well, I said hello to you. God bless. Uh, Father, my question is this. Uh, when you read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 44, and the same mm -hmm. thing in, in uh, Mark, mm -hmm. both of those Gospels relate to the fact how they did Jesus when he was dying on the cross, and you the Son of God, come on down. And then the both of them ended, ended that chapter by saying that uh, both that were crucified with him just reviled him also. Right. But yet when you get to Luke, there's a switch. Luke decides to... And put in the good thief and the bad thief issue. Sorry there. That's the good thief and the bad thief. Right. When you get to John, John says nothing. Why is there this great discrepancy at this, with yeah. this particular you know, issue there? A couple, things yeah. to keep, yeah, a couple things to keep in mind. You know, the evangelists, especially Mark and Luke, were not around. And actually, even though Matthew was an apostle, he wasn't at the crucifixion either. I mean... All the apostles had run away. Um, and the, you know, the, there's this 
first element where the thieves, both thieves, revile Christ. But here's something to keep in mind about St. Luke. You have to read um, Acts of the Apostles fairly carefully, but you see that in Acts of the Apostles, St. Paul went from uh, Ephesus to Corinth and then over to Philippi, and then St. Luke joined him and traveled with him to Jerusalem and stayed with him in Jerusalem, even when he was under arrest in Caesarea uh, Maritima for two years. So St. Luke spent almost two years in the Holy Land, especially Jerusalem and Caesarea, talking to people as eyewitnesses. That's why he says in uh, the beginning of the gospel that he's giving a more orderly account based on eyewitnesses, the witnesses that he met. And he's the one, while he is in Jerusalem between 58 uh, well, it's about May of 58 until about October, November of 59. So it's about a year and a half, actually, that he's there. He's the one that learns that story about the uh, good thief. And uh, we uh, doesn't give his name, but he learns that story. So there were a number of other eyewitnesses. St. Mark had no contact with that. And... What St. Luke is doing is giving another bit of data that they apparently both had begun by reviling Jesus, but then the good thief has a conversion while hang, hanging on the cross. And St. Luke includes that that the others just didn't know about. So it's not so much a contradiction, it's that St. Luke by living in Jerusalem in the, the, the 50s, learns this story. And if you also pay attention to Luke's gospel, you see that, especially if you know the Holy Land a bit, uh, you see that he doesn't have a very good sense of how traveling around Galilee was. It doesn't seem that St. Luke knew the uh, geography of Galilee very well at all. So he just had stories that he put down there, many of which came from Mark, in fact. But then when he's in Jerusalem, he has a lot more details. You see how he focuses on Jerusalem because he was living with the Christians of Jerusalem and he picked up what they remembered and he included that material in his gospel. So that's why he has that and the other two just didn't know about it, so they just skip over that, okay? All right, let's now go over to Dave in Yorba Linda, uh, California, with an email. He writes, given the Blessed Virgin, the Blessed Mother Mary asked for Russia to be consecrated, did adding Ukraine to the mix dilute the consecration? Dave in Yorba Linda. Dave, um, I don't think so at all. And here's why. Our Lord's grace is not limited. You don't dilute His grace. His grace is infinite. What Christ did on the cross, the cross at which the Blessed Mother stood, that grace that he won on the cross is infinite. There's no way to dilute it. There's no way to run out. It's an infinite, unlimited amount of grace. And I think it's important to note that the Pope made this consecration of Russia and Ukraine at the request of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic bishops. That's very important. And I think to, to see that the grace of God can be there for Ukraine. Ukraine is not a perfect society. They, 
you know, it's not as if they don't have problems with some governmental corruption in the past and things like that, but not anything that deserved what the Russians are doing to them. So we want to pray and consecrate uh, Ukraine and Russia to Our Lady. Um, and I don't think that that's a dilution. That addition is probably good for everybody involved. Then we have an email from Melody who asks, Hi, Father Mitch, I'm a daughter of parents who are separated and I have some questions. Did Mary have any other children besides Jesus? How did Jesus love his father when he was younger? And how can we love our father and mother like Jesus did? Melody. Uh, okay, a couple things. You know, in terms of other children, remember how it says the, there are brothers and sisters of Jesus. There's brothers are named, and one of his sisters is. And then we find, let's take a look at Mark chapter 6, verse 3. And then you find that in Mark 15, right around verse 45 or something, uh, I forget precisely, but it's right, right around verse 45, that the mother of his brothers, James and Joses, is a woman named Mary, but not the mother of Jesus. She is Mary, who is also identified in John's gospel as Mary, the wife of Clopas. So Jesus' brothers and sisters are the children of Our Lady's sister, Mary, and her husband, Clopas. And by sister, it means most likely sister-in-law, okay? So that, that's why you have two Marys in the family. It's her sister-in-law. Uh, that's one thing. So, she, no, Our Lady didn't have other children, just our Lord Jesus. Secondly, how did he love his father when he was younger? I assume you mean the Heavenly Father. And you see, his love of the Father is he wants to be in the temple, wants to remain in the temple when he's 12, because he wants to be about his father's business. And the way that he loves the Father is the same from all eternity. Namely, he gives himself, he accepts everything the Father gives him because he says, John chapter 16, the gospel for Trinity Sunday, everything I have is from the Father and everything I have I give to the Father. That's how he loves the Father. And when we love our parents, even in a stressful situation like separation, we accept them the way God God loves and accepts them. It doesn't mean that we say that anything bad that either one have done is good, but we love them. Not any wrong they may have done, and not their failures, but them as persons. And we give ourselves to them and we accept them. That's how we're doing exactly what Jesus did, giving ourselves and accepting the others. All right. Lord, bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, we can bring you this program and all our shows because the network is brought to you by you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you. Mm -hmm.